What's up, everyone? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 413, fun afternoon edition of the mm. show, because we have a very special guest coming to us all the way from Cormier, France. Caitlin Gerben is joining us on the show, one of our favorite guests, one of our local hometown heroes. She placed third at UTMB a couple of weeks back. We're going to talk to her about that, as well as her North Cascades high route adventure that she did with uh, Jenny Ebag recently. So that'll be a really fun conversation. I'm excited about today's show. Sit back, relax, everyone. Ginger Runner Live begins now. Ginger Runner. Yay! What's up, everyone? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 413. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy Tuesdays to spend a little bit of it with us. Hi, and Kim. This lunchtime edition, follow up to our breakfast edition from last yeah, week. I kind of, I kind of like this like <laughs> afternoon hour. Uh, last week we had Marianne on the show, also coming to us live from France. Uh, that was the morning edition for us. So that was a that was a, a learning experience. That was early for us. <laughs> like you have to be fully awake <laughs> uh, because of the time difference, obviously, where she was. Our guest today also in France, but lives here locally, but uh, is still there from UTMB. Caitlin Gerben will be joining us on the show today. And we're very, very excited to chat with her after her incredible third place performance at UTMB, her first time at UTMB. But we're also going to be talking about her recovery from an injury last year, her big North Cascades high route adventure that she did with uh, Jenny Abeg right here in the Pacific Northwest, just maybe a month and a half ago, just before UTMB. Lots to cover in today's show. I'm very excited. Uh, but before we introduce our incredible guest, Caitlin, there's Kim. Hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Doing well. Hi, everyone. There you are. Kim Newberry here, as always. Um, if you have questions for our wonderful guest, Caitlin, please ask them in the chat. And of course, if you're new, come say hi. Come say hi. Lots of, lots of chatter about owls and your shirt today. I did just drop a new video. It is a new trail tested video, and I did get swooped by an owl in that video. And I include that footage. It was wild. Uh, I'm still a bit petrified from it, but yeah, it, it was super fun. So go watch that video. Uh, before we introduce our guest, we would like to thank the GR crew. It's because of them that we're able to do these live shows every single week. We do our daily live streams, trail tested, our reviews, everything that we do on the channel is because of our GR crew. So if you'd like to join the, the crew of runners from around the world, head on over to patreon.com slash the ginger runner. All tiers get access to some super fun perks, including the upcoming GR GR. We're announcing it here right now, which is happening October 10th through 16th. It is our annual seven days of run fun. It's a community-based event uh, with seven challenges, one challenge each day. We'd love for you to join. RunGRGR.com is where that's at. Registration will open within the next 24, 48 hours. Hmm. So stand by. It's going to be super fun. Uh, but a big shout out to our GR crew. They get advanced notice of that type of thing. Uh, so it's definitely worth joining for that. And we like to shout out one individual in particular at the top tier on our Patreon, uh, Brian Sands, longtime supporter, super incredible human being, supports so many things, ultra and trail running and the community, both ours and like so many others. We're just so thankful for him and what he does for this incredible community. Without further ado, uh, she's waiting patiently. It's very late where she is in France. She's probably consumed six croissants by this point, plus oh. maybe a bottle of wine. I don't know. It's <laughs> France. Everything happens in France. Uh, so excited to welcome back to the show, Caitlin Gerben. Yay. Hi. 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 Thanks for having me on, guys. Good to see you. Uh, we are so freaking proud of you, Caitlin, for what you did at UTMB. It was so amazing to watch from afar. Uh, you just absolutely crushed the course and 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 placed third. You are now a few weeks re uh, removed from it. How's the body recovering? Like how's recovery and and all that sort of stuff? What what's it look like for you? Uh, it's good. Yeah, we're, I think we're we're like ten days, eleven days out from the race. So I did. Um, I've been doing like a few hikes and walks through town, but today was like my first actual like run, um, which is like kind of in quotations. I'm out here with my husband, Ellie, and we went up, um, this big peak kind of behind the house. So, um, yeah, super fun. Body's feeling good. Um, to be honest, it's like really a joy to recover in a place that's this beautiful because like, you don't really have to go very far to see views. Like I can just like, see, like you just look out the window and there's already views of mountains. Um, and so it's been really nice to just kind of like relax here after the race um, and get my feet up and just kind of enjoy, um, you know, in, enjoy the area without really having the stress and pressure of, of needing to do a race because I already did it. 
Yeah. <laughs> did you sort of plan ahead? Like, I know you got there a bit in advance, but we, we see this often from U.S. athletes who do travel to race UTMB is that they either get there well in advance or they get there like 24 hours before. <laughs> so what was your strategy and why does this recovery sort of play into that? Yeah. So I was able to get out here about two weeks before the race. And so I did, um, I was kind of like assessing some different options, but basically what it meant is I could do my peak training back on my home trails, um, which was super fun. I went and spent a couple of days on the Wonderland trail, um, which I know is like near and dear to me. And also I feel like it's really good prep for doing UTMB, um, really similar style of trails. And so I spent some days there and then was able to come out here for two weeks and Ellie and I actually spent most of that time in Cormier in Italy. So it's like just across um, on the other side of Mont Blanc. It's only like a 30 minute drive. So really, really close to the start of Chamonix. Um, and it's just a little bit quieter over here. And so we were able to spend some time here, recover for the race. And then, um, yeah, I'm also my, you know, Ellie is also doing a race actually starting this next weekend. And so that is why I'm still here. Um, I know some people maybe think I'm just like moving here because it's so awesome, but, um, <laughs> no, but, it, but it's been nice because it, you know, I think maybe that's something we can talk about, but being able to like have each other to support, you know, for our own races, while also like, you know, timing up like taper and recovery and everything is, is actually been really fun. And it's just such a cool opportunity that we get to be able to spend some time out here. And, um, yeah, I've, I've, you know, never really been able to spend this much time away in a place before a race before or after a race. And it's definitely a different experience. And I think, um, something that if I'm able to pull off in the future, I think really helps just kind of settle into things, but, um, obviously there's a lot of factors that go into making that happen. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of logistics and making sure everything at home is organized and things taken care of. Yeah, we'll talk about the crew side of things and, and you know, mm -hmm. your partnership with your husband, Ellie, who we've had on the show before is is super cool and unique because you're both extremely talented ultra athletes doing big things. So I do want to talk about that uh, later in the show, just sort of how he was there to support you for UTMB, how you'll be there to support him at tour. But I want to go back a little bit in time only because you've had quite an, an amazing last couple of years because you um, had a major injury last year that sidelined you for a good portion of the year. And that, I mean, kind of shows how amazing your performances have been just in the last couple of months. So can we go back to what happened with your body last year, how it sort of took you out of the race cycle and stuff like that? Let's go back a little bit. Yeah. So it was in the spring of 2021. So last year, April, where I um, had really like my first real and major injury um, in all of running, which was like, go for, you know, go from like being healthy for, you know, eight years to then like the big whammy. So I had a stress fracture in the neck of my femur. Um, and that's a really scary place to have. I mean, I think stress fractures are like terrifying in general, but I think that particular position is really high risk and was definitely pretty alarming and scary. So, um, with that, I took a pretty conservative approach to my recovery. Um, at the time it felt like kind of the end of the world, to be honest, because, yeah. you know, I had missed basically a whole year of racing in 2020 because of the pandemic. And then finally was kind of like coming out of that and getting excited for races to start happening in 2021. And then like right at the start of that is when I got injured. And, and so I ended up missing basically all of last summer due to just not running for, you know, I think three months or so I went without running. And then, um, you know, I, I thought during that time, like, oh, maybe I'll, I'll push and try to race something in the fall of 2021. Um, but ultimately just kind of decided that that felt like rushing things a bit too much and felt sure. like I, you know, like should just give myself the time I need to recover, get over that. And then, you know, look ahead into 2022 and think about like what I really wanted to do, um, this last year. So yeah, it's, you know, I think injuries are, are hard to deal with no matter who you are, or what the injury is. And I think like there's lots of different, um, I don't know, different approaches to it. And I think, you know, at the time I definitely like didn't always see the positives, but I think now that I'm like fully out of it and like, you know, over a year removed, I actually like look back on that time and like, I'm, 
I don't know if I'd say I'm grateful for it, but I also feel like there are a lot of silver linings. Um, just as you, you know, you do, you learn things and it's, it's a chance to reset and reflect and really, um, adapt and, you know, coming back and out of that, I feel, um, yeah, I, I've just felt like there's, there's always some good things that can come out of bad situations like that. So, yeah, it's, it's a super mature sort of mindset mm -hmm. because for someone who hasn't had an injury, let alone, a. a like a significant injury like that, that takes a professional out of the sport for oh, how many mm. weeks, months was it? Like six months? Uh, April until really August that I was starting to run again. So almost like three or four months. Forced time off like that is such a difficult space to navigate both mentally and physically because you want to get back to training. You want to feel that normalcy again. Uh, we talk about injuries a lot on the show. We have, I mean, everyone will go through some sort of injury period. You were simultaneously going through your injury period, very similar injury. Yeah. And like the mental side of it is such a huge thing. So that, I mean, Caitlin, shout out to you for having such a mature sort of approach to it because it can be absolutely frustrating. I know that for a fact. We have tons of live questions. Do you want to grab and one? I will say part of the silver lining that maybe came out of Caitlin's injury is uh, hiking on Tiger Mountain with us and learning the secrets of, of shrooming out there. Foraging? <laughs> yes. We taught Caitlin we... the ways. <laughs> I learned where the shanty paths are, as you call them. <laughs> and actually, I mean, that's like a thing that like now we just were out on the trails today and like I've been off of the trails for a couple of weeks. Um, but there's a bunch of mushrooms popping now. And I'm like, I feel like my eyes are trained <laughs> to see that. So it's like a whole other side of the sport. <laughs> yeah. We should, I think I'm already seeing a race. Uh, we have to design in the future. It's like a foraging. Like you have to find very specific. Very specific mushrooms. Okay. And you have to eat them and just see how, <laughs> just see if you finish. I don't know about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's get to some of the live questions. Yeah, just a reminder, everyone, we uh, do obviously have Caitlin here live with us. So if you have questions for her, please pop them in the chat. A uh, question from Angela. Angela asks, does strength training play a part in your training? And if so, what kinds of things do you feel are most important to incorporate into your routine? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's one of the silver linings that I think I got out of my injury is that um, you know, I had always done like a little bit of PT or would like, you know, think I was doing PT or do like a little bit of strength, but I feel like it was often just kind of generic. And I think through my injury, I started working with a PT, developed a relationship um, with him so that I kind of have really learned like what my own quirks are, about like what sorts of areas flare up and like what things are really actually helpful for me to do before I run or work out or race. Um, and so I don't do anything super crazy in the gym, but it's just, I'd say like very specific to things that I actually know help issues that, um, that I have. And so, um, yeah, it's, it, it takes like a little bit of a nudge, I think, to really like get that into your routine. But if you can, you know, if anyone is like either dealing with an injury or just like wants to do injury prevention, even doing like one or two appointments with a PT or someone who's really knowledgeable with that, that can help you kind of develop a little bit of a routine that then you do on your own, I think could be um, really helpful. And it's just like, sometimes it's only like a five minute thing. Um, but now it's like, you know, when I'm about to go race, I know exactly what few exercises I want to do, um, you know, in a, you know, leading up to that, that I know is going to really help set me up for success. Um, as opposed to just kind of like randomly doing push ups or, core or something and thinking like, oh, I'm getting strong and fit for running. Great. You know, I right. think like, you know, less is more and really just like being um, intentional about what you're doing is it can be really helpful. Yeah. Everything sort of has a purpose, right? Everything you're doing very purposeful. Yeah. I want to talk a bit about that time frame between kind of coming out of the recovery from the injury, your body's beginning to work again. Running is probably hot on the mind. You're looking at the 2022 race calendar and how your big North Cascades project sort of came to be. Again, this is a conversation I think we'll have to have you back on. We'll bring Jenny on. We'll, we'll chat about this because it's such a big thing and we're making a big movie about it and stuff like that. But I am curious how your 2022 plan sort of laid out with this injury recovery and making sure that your body's ready to handle big stuff and why you chose the races and things to do that you chose. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would love to have a longer conversation with Jenny. Um, shout out to her if she happens to listen to this or is watching now, but, um, 
Yeah, I think, you know, another thing that I just like had thought about a lot coming out of my injury was just a reminder to do things that are true to me and that are exciting to me. Um, and you know, we only have a limited amount of time. And so really just like choosing things that are exciting and that you're passionate about, I think is what I, you know, set the intention to do in 2022. So, um, you know, my year really was anchored around UTMB. I knew I wanted to do UTMB. I knew I didn't want to over race. And so I didn't want to do a huge season leading up to that. Um, I thought that, you know, I've done a number of hundred milers before. So I felt like I knew I could go to the distance. I just wanted to like really smartly build up to that. And, and being in at the end of August, you know, I think there's so much that happens before that. So really making sure I was um, intentional about that um, was part of my plan. And so I did um, actually in, well, yeah, early season did some things. And then through the summer, it was really like, okay, I want to do this North Cascades high route. And I also want to do UTMB. And it was really just like taking the two and figuring out how could I, um, how could I make them both work? And did I think that I could get them to both work and be complementary to each other? And ultimately I decided that yes, they could. Um, I think like, you know, it could go either way, but I really wanted to make both work. So it's like, really just trying to figure out like, how can I, um, how can I continue training for UTMB while I'm doing whatever prep I need to do for this high route adventure. And also like, what are the things that I'm learning while doing this high route, whether it's like training my body or just mentally, what are things that I can do and really take forward into UTMB. And I was really thinking about both intertwined for like pretty much the whole summer. And so mm-hmm. all the other little, um, you know, projects or races and stuff that I was doing in the months leading up to that were really kind of just on the back burner and and just part of what I was doing to kind of lead up to um, to this high route and and UTMB. And you know, one of the things that um, the high route I think really demanded like so much of my mental energy. Um, like I was really just spending so much time staring at maps and like reading trip reports and um, figuring out logistics and. All like there's really, I mean, it would really be, it became almost like an obsession. And so a few times I had to kind of remind myself like, okay, am I sure I'm still able to like, you know, do what I need to do, be mentally present for UTMB. Um, and, you know, ultimately it just really came down to like prioritizing at the right time. I think in looking back, it was really helpful that, you know, having the high route for me was a great way to make sure like I wasn't overtraining for UTMB and I wasn't also like hyper focused on it to the point where I was like, you am going to dig myself into like a mental hole before the race even started. Right. Um, so I you know, poured all my energy into that while still getting in the training. And then after the high route finished, I like really flipped a hard switch and was like, okay, this was awesome. Like I want to celebrate that and honor that, but also like I'm really ready to focus on UTMB and I want that. And I'm like, happy to have the time now that the other adventure is done, like to really shift into that. Um, and so I think it really just allowed me to like stay fresh and, you know, have my body and my mind both ready to, to do something different and with them being two different, but complementary goals. I think that worked out really well for me. Yeah. For those who don't know yet, we've talked a little bit about it on the show, kind of mentioning it when it happened, but Caitlin is referring to the North Cascades high route, which is a, a route that her and Jenny essentially created sort of used, uh, historic routes that people have taken in the past, but connected this incredible line through the North Cascades in Washington state, um, all essentially 90% off trail through huge cruxes and glacier travel and all sorts of stuff that just really require a certain set of skills. So there it's interesting to see you do this huge caliber mountain traverse and then prepare for UTMB kind of back to back because they are so vastly different. Like not the typical lead up that somebody made. (laughs) Not even close. (laughs) Yeah. You know, you see people training for UTMB, you look at Walmsley Strava and it's like, oh shit. Yeah. Very specific. Lots of vert, trail running, speed work, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I know your history with Western States, you're very seasoned top 10 finisher there. You know what it takes to finish big hundreds like that speed and and the training and the dedication and the focus with the approach to UTMB this year, did you worry at all that you didn't have that right 
training or did you, were you just taking a new approach? Like I want to do the things I want to do and I just hope it works out. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I feel like historically for me, I always kind of taken my own approach to things. Like I haven't ever done anything quite as big as this high road. I mean, this is like, that was by far the biggest and burliest thing I've ever done as an athlete. Um, but I, I've always mixed in different forms of mountain travel into my training. Like even, um, leading up to Western States, I would, you know, I remember, I think this happened every year. I would like, was supposed to do a long run and then decided, oh, actually I'm going to go ski this volcano instead, because mm -hmm. that sounds fun. And you know what? I can still get the running in and maybe having a day off of the trails is actually good for my body. So I feel like I've actually really always done that type of approach with like intertwining different types of mountain travel into training. And I think, I really do think that you can do both and be successful with mixing things up a little bit. Um, but it really takes like some, I think really just identifying like what are the key workouts or runs that I need to be doing to get myself ready for this race and what are the things I can compromise on. Um, and also just kind of ignoring maybe what other people, people think or do, because I think like your question, Ethan, about like, was I worried about it? Like if I was just like doing my thing, no, I wasn't worried about it. I was like, I trust my body. I was trusting my training. I was confident in my approach and just kind of reminded myself, like I've always done things a little bit different and it's always worked. And so like, don't stress about that. But the times that I would worry is when I would like start comparing to what other people are doing or hearing about what competitors of mine were going to be doing before the race and stuff. And it's just like, it's all just this head game. Like I think we all make comparisons. It's so easy to do that. Um, and think, you know, just the thing that we all need to remember all the time is just like, just do you do you, you know, like everyone's got a different approach. It doesn't mean there's a right approach. And I think things like, a hundred miles, especially in the mountains and something like a course like UTMB, there are just so many factors that go into a good race there that I don't think it all can be boiled down to specifics of numbers and training. Like there's just so much there, um, that I think anyone who says that there's a specific formula you need to follow for that is just wrong. Like there, every single person, I think if you profile every athlete, who raced UTMB, whether they're elite or mid pack or back of the pack, like everyone is going to have a slightly different approach. Um, and I think I would bet that most of the people that had like the best performances for themselves were the ones who really like took their own approach and listened to their bodies and, you know, did things that worked into their life and things that they were having fun doing and actually like went into the race ready to race and like celebrate that rather than just like following a specific plan or formula the whole time. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Cause I, yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, looking back at your last couple of years, you've had so many circumstances, the injury, the time away from running to probably sort of figure out what matters to you most. And knowing that you just did this incredible high route, you also did a uh, great reminder from Brian in the chat earlier about how you and Fernanda did the La Vuelta a Yellow FKT earlier mm -hmm. in the year. Like you did all these amazing things this year that are historic, um, not necessarily a race. You know, you're not focused on speed or doing this or winning this. I know you did mm -hmm. Trans Grand Canaria, but you know, that's sort of the, the outside um, outlier in this year for you, this build up to UTMB. So it's really cool. I love hearing you say that, like doing the things that matter to you most and letting the training be there and trusting that. And I think this also echoes kind of the sentiment that there isn't this perfect kind of formula to lead up to being successful in a race. And we saw that with their interview last week with Marianne as well, leading yep. up to Western States. 100%. She was injured and didn't even get mm -hmm. to hit trails until May before. Um, so I think that's it's encouraging for people who maybe can't or don't follow a very specific or if uh, or if circumstances sort of throw a wrench into their cogs, right? Like yeah. things can work yeah. out. Things can work out. Look at look at this. This is, you know, this is amazing. We have a live question. You want to get to that question there? I think it might kind of dovetail in nicely. Yeah, this question is from Eric. And Eric says, of course, you've had great success in the past. But if you if you had to pick one key ingredient for UTMB success, what aspect workout was the thing that got you to the podium? Mm, one thing? Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> it can I don't up. even know if I can answer that. <laughs> um, 
Uh, let me see. Okay, I, I'm gonna cheat and not give just one thing, but I'll like I'll, let me just rattle off a few. Like you're allowed. Themes. There's no rules. Oh, going too long. Okay. So, <laughs> um, I think I had really consistent training, um, which I think was important. I really think I did a good job, like recovering, like just prioritizing recovery in my training and and leading up to the race. Um, and also I was able to eat really well during the race. And that's something that I, um, you know, I'd say like for quite a few years in racing hundreds, I never had a problem eating. Everything was fine. And then I had a string of a few longer races where I had some issues with like nausea and not being able to eat towards like the end. Usually it was after like mile 75, 80, somewhere in there. Um, and so that's the thing that I've been working on and also like big adventures and like things like a week long, um, <laughs> high route where you're like eating constantly, I think it was like, yeah, that was just, that, that's one thing I came out of it being just really stoked about that. I was like, Oh, I really like nailed the, the fueling. So happy about that. There was, I want to talk about it. Yeah. You're thinking about the like, exact same thing I'm thinking of right now. There was a tweet <laughs> during the race where someone reported you coming in and like talking to Ellie that you were like, I puked. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I don't know about my stomach. Something's wrong. And everyone's like, like trying to problem solve, trying to problem food. solve. Yeah. Cause you puked. <clears throat> and I know I like, I know you and you never puke. And if you do puke, it's like something's bad. Uh -huh. And then Ellie and I were texting. Ellie's like, none of that happened. <laughs> No. Yeah. He mentioned that after the race. No, that I don't know. I'm not sure where maybe they got me mixed up with someone else or like, like there was one part where I came in and it was like, whoa, there was carnage out there. It was so hot. There were people laying on the side of the trail. Like, but like, I was, I was fine. Um, yeah, I, I didn't have any stomach problems or puke or anything during the race. <laughs> that was all fine. Yeah. When, t when Ellie texted, or I think I texted <laughs> Ellie, I was bothering Ellie a lot, like way too much. So I'm texting him a ton, like Caitlin's doing this and Caitlin's doing that. Did she puke? And Ellie's like, Where what, she are you, puked? what are you talking about, dude? She's totally fine. Um, I do want to talk about <clears throat> doing something like the North Cascades high route and how that maybe mentally prepared you for UTMB. Uh, cause I, I was fortunate enough to get to interview you and Jenny after the, the high route to kind of get a sense of where that put you both mentally and what that adventure was like when you take on a big thing like that. And that was, that's a big thing. Um, did it set you up mentally for UTMB? Like, were you able to approach UTMB as like, I just did seven days on this crazy route, 24 hours on this mountain is going to be nothing. Like, did it give you that sense of sort of power or confidence or are they just separate? Um, they're not entirely separate, but I wouldn't say that the experience in the North Cascades made me just feel like UTMB was going to be a walk in the park. Um, I think that anytime you're showing up at a race with that level of competition, you really got to be in your A game, um, and being complacent in that is not going to, I mean, I think it's not going to work well for me. So, um, yeah, I don't think, I don't think it really like worked in that way but I would say like I really felt like I knew my body could do the mileage and the, the elevation gain and so um I you know part of that was North Cascades part of it is just my experience in racing mountain hundreds but I really was trying to draw on that a lot before the race and just like trying to stay calm and trust that like I know my body can do this and like I know you know, especially after an injury and, and then adding that on top of a break, um, from COVID that it's, you, you kind of need to remind yourself, like, I know how to do this. Like I can do this. Um, but I think definitely having, having the high route in there in my back pocket, I think was just really good to kind of normalize the mountain trouble and like being out in the dark and out for a long day and really just kind of like normalizing that they're like, yep. Like, I know I can move when tired. I did that a couple weeks ago. And like, I'm just going to go out and like have myself a fun day out there. We uh, are huge Caitlin Gerben fans in this house. I don't think that's a secret. Um, we probably tell you more than you'd like to hear uh, every day. Um, <laughs> awkward. <laughs> but yeah, a little awkward. Uh, we should stop ringing her doorbell. and Daily text. Just daily text. Hey, you're, you're awesome. awesome. Um, UTMB 
obviously some of the best in the world to the start line. Uh, you were supposed to start UTMB last year, but the injury took you out, correct? So this correct. is your first time running this race. Uh, you have, you've raced probably many of these athletes before, whether it's at States or Trans Grand Canary or any of these sort of events. Did you go into this race with a strategy? Did you go in with this? Uh, basically, how did Caitlin Gerben approach UTMB this year? Um, and how did it end up playing out the way it did? Yeah. Um, I think most of the time um, for big races, I like to try to set time goals because you can never really control what other people do. Um, but usually I can go into a race, have any, an idea of what I can do on the course. Um, and I think like that, that actually played out um, in the race this year. Um, the first half of the race, I got into Cormier within my buffer, I was like a little bit behind where I thought I could be, um, but was feeling like really relaxed. It's about the halfway point. And my goal was really to come in there just feeling like, okay, like that's where the race starts, like ready to, ready to go from that point. Um, and so I did that. So I was really happy about that. Um, but what I didn't know, I mean, it's, it's hard to get info, you know, throughout, especially yeah. as you go through the night. Um, and so when I got in there, I learned that, Katie and Marianne had come into that aid station, I think an hour or over an hour before me, which was extremely fast. I mean, I, I, they just like dominated the first half of the race. Um, and so there was already a really big gap there. And I think that's something that I wasn't really anticipating. And that's one of those, um, things that you have to kind of balance. I mean, as, as an elite, just racing, like, you know, you can race the course and race the time, but you also really have to know like where your competitors are at and then make a decision about if you're going to push and run someone else's race. Right. Um, or if you're just going to kind of like do your thing and then get to that point. And so being my first race at UTMB, my goal was really just run the first half by feel, get into Cormier feeling good at that point, point the race starts. And I felt pretty confident I could like make up gaps, um, given that. An hour is, is a pretty long ways to go, especially when in that next segment, you know, I ran from, you run from Cormier to uh, La Folie and Champé-Lac. So it's an almost, I think it's, it's almost a 50 K segment from there. And you do that kind of starting in the dark and then through sunrise and then get through. And I ran that next section, I thought really well. And, and then learned that the two girls ahead of me were also running about the same pace but I'd put an hour on the girls who were behind me. Right. And so now I was kind of in this weird, like, you know, almost like no man zone where like, I wasn't really seeing the other people on the trails an hour um, gap ahead an hour gap behind. Um, and really just kind of had to adjust my race plan from there. Um, I think, you know, again, like first time at UTMB, I really like was stoked that I was running in third and was feeling pretty comfortable in that, in that position. Like I knew I was kind of running within my limits um, and also like, didn't, you know, it was getting really hot too. And so I, I kind of was like, had to make a decision about if I really wanted to try to push to try to catch the girls ahead of me, or in doing that, would I risk blowing up or doing something stupid myself? And then, you know, now suddenly be the carnage that people are picking up from behind. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, it, race plans don't always work out. <laughs> That's fine. But, you know, I, I feel like overall I was just able to run like a pretty smart, consistent race and, um, really, really stoked about coming in third here. It seemed perfectly consistent. Mm -hmm. Like it seemed, uh, again, outsiders watching the live stream as much as the female uh, women's coverage that we could get and, and actually follow along. Mm -hmm. It was just one of those, like, <laughs> Holy crap. Every time you come into an aid station and we'd see on a camera, there'd be a smile. There'd be this like kind of jovial, like that's Caitlin, like totally on a good, on a good role. So that's really cool. That strategy actually played out, uh, in your mind of like, oh, I could chase down the lead pack and blow up and cause a huge disaster. And then I get caught or I can kind of maintain. Because it, we, when we were watching it play out, it just felt like you were alone. I mean, as far as the women's field went, totally. right? Once, I yeah. think I'd, we'd talked about it a little bit, wondering like, how were you feeling? Did you feel alone? Did you, you know? <laughs> I felt alone. I Did felt you? very alone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know there's obviously thousands of people running this race, but to see, it, it just felt like, you know. Just you and the cows. Like Katie and Marianne were here. Space, yeah. Then there's Caitlin and then there's the space and then there's, you know, the remainder of the women's yeah. field. And we had that conversation of wondering like how you felt 
um, competitively feeling like maybe you're in this like Caitlin pocket. <laughs> you vocalized to us in the yeah. past, like after Tiger Claw, you like to see competition. You want to be a part of the competition, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, exactly. That um, during Tiger Claw, like being able to see where people are at and like, I mean, it really just like helps with the race vibe and it, it, you know, it's not abnormal to be pretty spaced out in hundreds. Um, but I think like being spaced out in addition to having a really big gap on both ends just makes for like kind of a, yeah, I've never really had to deal with that dynamic mentally before in a race. Mm. And so it's like trying to figure out like what the right, what's the right balance between, you know, what's the push and pull between running conservatively versus pushing versus, you know, taking the time I need at aid stations versus should I just keep going? And the clock is always ticking. Right. But it's just like, it's a little bit of a different dynamic. And so especially like at the end of a race when your brain is kind of mush and there's no one else really like no one around, you know, I'd, I'd pass back and forth with some guys once in a while, but I really, I mean, honestly, other than even the night section before I got into Cormier, I would say I ran probably 70% of the race alone. Wow. Um, I, I felt like a lot of, um, I was thinking about Wonderland quite a bit actually, but the difference on running the Wonderland trail is I had a pacer, like I had a friend with me almost the whole right. time. And so even if I was talking to them, it's still like just knowing you've got someone that kind of like holds you accountable the whole time. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a different, I feel like I, like, I don't, I, I haven't talked to very many people who've raced UTMB about this specifically, but I just would be curious because I feel like, um, it's kind of a different experience at UTMB than I expected to have just given how many people race it. Um, and that's not to say that like there weren't tons of, you know, spectators, like all the aid stations, the volunteers and like going through towns, like people were just like lighting it up. So that was super fun. Um, but you know, once I got two minutes outside of that eight, then it was, it was quiet for the next few hours until I saw, um, you know, got to another aid station. So just a little bit of a different, different dynamic. And that also makes me excited to come back next year and see if I can play with that a little bit more. Cause I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's hard to have the same exact race experience twice. And I, I'm excited to, to see how, how that might play out differently. I feel like anytime Caitlin runs a race a second time, the second time is crazy. Like you want to watch <laughs> Don't it. Don't jinx me. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just saying like, I can't wait to tune in. Uh, it's going to be yeah. great. I'll pay money to watch. Um, there is uh oh, shoot. There was something I was just going to. I was just thinking about how, you know, obviously how Caitlin's Western States played out in that final mile. Um, Marianne talked about that in her interview with us. Specifically, because she yeah. was worried that you were going to do that to her. To yeah, <laughs> She thought about it at Western States, yep. and she also thought about it at UTMB. So your experience in that last mile has influenced other racers' <laughs> final miles. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's like putting fear in people's minds when they should just be, like, <laughs> celebrating the last few steps. <laughs> you know? Well, that I mean, that moment oh, is no. so ingrained now, I think, into the culture. Like, you got to race to the end you know, to the very, very, very end. Um, yeah, what I was gonna what I was gonna mention is growing well, not growing up, you didn't grow up here, but you do live in the Pacific Northwest. I am curious how you would compare training here in the Northwest. Of course, any chance that I get to to sing the praises of the Northwest, I'm gonna do it. But you use the terrain here in this beautiful neck of the woods to train for something like UTMB. Was it enough? Uh, do you feel like this is like you can train here in Washington state and perform well at UTMB? Were there other things that you felt you had in your training that helped there? Stuff like that. Uh, absolutely. And I, um, would love to see more Pacific Northwest runners racing out here. And um, we actually had a really good showing of, uh, Northwest runners, um, many of who totally crushed it. And so, um, yeah, I, I hope that we continue to kind of send more people out here because I think the trails that, you know, we have access to just really prepare you well. Um, a few things to think of in particular, um, we have quite a few areas where you can go and get a four to 6,000 foot climb. And I think um, that's something that's really important to be able to train um, and so a number of the climbs I did on the high route, um, were 6,000 feet or 6,000 foot descent. 
Um, and that's <laughs> pretty long. And so I think that was really helpful. Um, another thing is I mentioned that before, like one of my, a few of my peak runs I did on the Wonderland trail um, near Mount Rainier. And I'd say if, you know, if you, someone wants to like kind of experience something similar to running on the UTMB, but on the TMB, but can't get out here for that, for to make the trip, then the Wonderland trail is like a really, really great place to, to go. It's um, a little bit different, definitely way less people. But um, I'd say like the aesthetic of running around a massive, like glacier covered peak um, you know, doing full circle and getting different views from the whole time and going kind of in and out of the forest and up into the Alpine. Um, that's a really similar vibe. And so I, I was just like, I was really grateful to have so much experience on the Wonderland Trail while I was running UTMB just because mentally it's just like, I kind of felt like it felt familiar. And I think, mm. um, sometimes that can be a nice feeling in a race. Um, I also wanted to talk about crew because that's something that we, uh, mentioned at the top of the show. There's a discussion going on online right now. I think it's on Jermaine's post, I believe, and you commented on it. And there's some there's some good feedback from elites and hopefully more mid packers and back of the packers now. But there's been this discussion around the idea of crew and is it necessary to have crew or pacers at these big hundred mile events? And there's a I can see arguments from both sides of the coin. I definitely lean towards I like crew for a variety of reasons, and people in the back of the pack can also attest that like crews can actually be beneficial to your race actually succeeding. Mm -hmm. For you, having such a, an amazing partner, and you both are ultra runners, you both help each other, um, how important was it for you to have Ellie there? Because uh, I believe he was your... Oh, no, you also had Esther, but I guess how important was it to have yep. like a good and crew? And ben. Yeah, well, I'll just take a second to, to shout out my, my crew. So I had um, my husband, Ellie Gervin. I had my North Face um, team manager and friend, Esther Kendall. And then also our uh, friend, Northwest legend, Ben Gibbard. So mm -hmm. it was it was a super fun, um, super fun crew dynamic. Um, you're only allowed one person actually inside the aid area to crew you. And so Ellie was always that guy. Um, so I'd, I'd roll in, usually I'd see Esther and Ben, you know, outside of the aid and, you know, cheering. And then I'd run in, see Ellie, switch my bottles, get more food and then run out. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, I, I love having crew. I love having, um, having that support. I think, racing in a competitive field without crew when other people have crew is a really big disadvantage. Um, I've done that in races a few times before, and I feel like a, a lot of times like races can come down to a couple minutes or, you know, even just like having, um, being able to like switch something that your crew might have that you don't have access to in the aid station could be a game changer in your race. So I think, yeah, definitely like Crew, crew is fun. And also like, I love crewing people. And I feel like, I mean, like, I don't know if everyone would say this, but like a lot of people like really enjoy the crewing experience. And I feel like it's like a really big part of the community of trail and ultra running. And um, yeah, I don't know. Like I, I, I think as a whole, like it's awesome to have. Um, is it totally necessary? No. If a race like UTMB or some other big race decided to say no crew allowed at all, we'd all get by just fine, but it would be a level playing field for everyone. Um, and I think, you know, otherwise, like if there's crew loud, like I'll, I'll be using a crew most of the time. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. We, we love it. We love crewing and also yeah. like being a part of other people's crews and experiences because, you know, mm -hmm. you run these big events. It's not, it's not just the runner, it's the runner and their family and their friends and their community. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's kind of a great way to sort of, bring everyone on board yeah angela in the chat says it adds so much community to a solo sport yeah and angela yeah. we spoke with angela who there's a movie on the channel uh about her and her experience at cascade crest she had 28 seconds to spare um finishing cascade crest last year and she said that the crew was the reason she was able to get in under the cutoffs because they were the ones that were like taking here's bottles yeah here's get your things here. get out of here yeah. you know something that <laughs> yep. not having a crew could have changed her day entirely um, I do want to sort of wrap up with, <clears throat> I guess, talking about what's next for you because you are about to step into that crew role. <laughs> uh, what's Ellie about to undertake and how does your crewing Ellie look versus Ellie's crewing of your, of you? 
Okay, so um, I don't want to steal Ellie's thunder too much. But he's running Tour de Jeans. It's a 220, 40, I don't know, something like that, <laughs> mile race in Italy. Um, it's a big loop, and it has – at, it like 80,000 feet of climbing or something. It's basically like a double hard rock plus some. And so it takes <laughs> um, anywhere from like four to six days. And so the big difference between crewing is that Ellie crewed me for one day and I get <laughs> the pleasure of crewing him <laughs> for like four or five days. Um, but it's also like way different. I think like the, you know, the stress um, the stress is just spread out differently. Right. So like, instead of these like really high intensity moments of like coming in every few hours and having like seconds to spare in a crew, you know, in a race like UTMB, um, Tour de Jean's is like, a, is a multi-day race. And so, and also like he's, he's normally, he's very self-sufficient. I think your crew is one of those people that often prefers to do races without crew or without pacers, just likes doing it solo. Um, it's just, I like supporting him and want to be here for it too. So I'm glad that, um, I get to kind of be a part of the, uh, be, I get to be a part of the race without actually running the whole thing. Cause that's a very long ways to run. It's so long <laughs> and he's done it before and he did an amazing job. I can't wait to see, uh, what he does this year. <clears throat> Do you want to mention LBS? This is a Gerben classic. Uh, we don't oh, have do to. I? We don't have to. <laughs> Again. <laughs> uh, but it's certainly something that you taught us, and now it's part of our lexicon whenever we talk yep. about <laughs> suffering and hitting those low points. Everyone, it's the second pandemic. It's going around. <laughs> it's spreading like wildfire. All the kids are talking about it. LBS just being uh, what I think we call little bitch syndrome, and it's yes. just yeah. We can leave it at that. You, it's pretty. You funny. know, you you'll know when you have it. <laughs> <And you're, laughs> so, usually, it can be solved with a little bit of food and just sucking it up. <laughs> so. You'll know when you have it. <laughs> yeah. The best. Um, our guest today has been the incredible Caitlin Gerben, coming to us from France. Uh, you're in Cormier, right? Oh, I'm in Italy right now. Yeah, in, oh, in, in Cormier, but in Italy. Yeah. It's, but I actually, like, I can, like, I can see France from here, basically. So it's oh, very that, close. I keep, yeah, I keep thinking Cormier is in France. It is in Italy. It always has been. It hasn't changed. Um, what's it like being there now without being at mile, like, 55 or something of the 100 miler? Oh, uh, we love it here. I don't know. We spent uh, We spent a bunch of time here last year before and after tour, and then, uh, like I said, we were here before, like doing some more training for UTMB, and then now being back here, it's just, it's quiet. It's really pleasant. Love the trails and, um, yeah, good, really good Italian food. I mean, can't complain. Sounds great. And, and no, uh, no predator animals on the trails. No predators. No, yeah, no bears, no, no owl swooping, no mosquitoes. Do no, they, it's people really, hand really you baked pleasant. Goods? Oh. <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> well, we can't wait to have you back in the Pacific Northwest. Take your time. Uh, let you know. Let Ellie go out and do his little romp in the woods. I know that it's that's going to be super fun. Um, uh, I just really want to quickly mention Eric in the chat says for me it was BTS, big toddler syndrome, as my wife oh. joked during Leadville. <laughs> BTS, that's good too. Yes, like big toddler that... syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> I just picture like tears squirting out of the eyes from the side. Uh, Caitlin, where can people find you on social media? Where can they follow you and continue to follow maybe uh, maybe Ellie's adventures if you post photos and stuff like that? Where can they find you? Yes. Actually, uh, last year I went a little crazy and it got crazier the more sleep deprived I was and the more sleep deprived Ellie was. But I'll be posting hopefully a lot of videos like throughout Tour de Jean's race. Um, so you can find those in my stories on Instagram. I'm at Caitlin underscore G. My name is K-A-Y-T-L-Y-N. Um, like the and movie. then I'm on... Yep. And then I'm on um, Facebook and Strava, mostly the best ways. Sweet. Uh, our incredible guest, Caitlin Gerben, uh, talking about the North Cascades high route, as well as UTMB placing third. A huge congratulations to her. It's so awesome to see her absolutely crush UTMB. We can't yes. wait to see what she does next year and in between, of course. A uh, little bit of detail or additional information we are working on a really cool movie project about caitlin and jenny's north cascades high route that will be coming soon through the north face we're very excited about it uh and so that is something i'm working on currently 
Um, so stay tuned because that we'll definitely have Caitlin and Jenny back on the show to chat about that whole experience because it is a it is a full show in in and of itself. So we'll we'll chat more about that. Uh, before we wrap up the show, we do like to recognize members of the community who go above and beyond. We call it our GR Crew Member of the Week. Kim, who's this week's GR Crew Member? This week's GR Crew Member of the Week is Bettina. Uh, Bettina, just a little backstory. Bettina was uh, a winner of our rut entry during the adam we, peterman show yes so mm -hmm. we gave away an entry to the rut bettina traveled from the pacific northwest to go run the rut 11k and crushed it so she congratulations to bettina and also just a quick shout out to chuck and Lori who were there racing as well nice job gr crew representing at the rut uh, an amazing mountain event that just occurred this last weekend mike foot and his whole crew yeah. put on just such an, a great uh, event uh, so that's super awesome congratulations to all of you that's going to wrap up ginger runner live episode number 413 with our wonderful guest caitlin gerben thank you so much everyone for tuning in live or watching the archive or listening to the podcast we appreciate you very much and uh, get out there train hard race harder part of the hardest we'll see you guys next week thanks everyone let me click the outro yeah. button and uh, we'll see you for the after show. We're going to go right to the after show over on Patreon, patreon.com slash the ginger. Uh, see you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ginger.